Section 4. Material. We have learned that Air Force operations are absolutely at the mercy of a proper supporting logistics setup. It is most important that any Air Force commander, probably in any theater, and certainly in this theater, be provided a supply and repair establishment to the measure of his rate of operations. Such a setup must include adequate shipping from the zone of the interior. It must also include repair depots rapidly to effect modifications on aircraft and promptly to repair battle damage. In this theater, perhaps more than in any other, the maintenance establishment controls the scale of operation. This is due to the high casualty rate caused by the strength of enemy fighter opposition and heavy concentrations of defending anti-aircraft. On many of our missions, more than 200 heavy bombers return with battle casualties. It is normal for 25-50% to 50 of aircraft on a deep penetration into Germany to suffer some form of battle damage. This places a burden on repair establishments which had certainly not been recognized in peacetime planning and for which there was no adequate organization. One of the principal tasks of the 8th Air Force has been, therefore, the creation of an adequate air service command. Early in 1943, a board of officers from the United States headed by Major General Follett Bradley was sent to work with 8th Air Force in drawing up a satisfactory and realistic organization for the Air Service Command of this Air Force. I consider that General Bradley's committee performed an outstanding service and that the plan which was prepared was sound in every respect. It outlined a satisfactory organization and it included the minimal personnel for the efficient accomplishment of the task. Several months were lost before approval could be obtained from the War Department and the initiation of this plan implemented. The operational efficiency of the 8th Air Force will be in large part limited and circumscribed by the adequacy and effectiveness of 8th Air Service Command. I am convinced that the present organization is sound, it is realistic, it is cut to the measure of the problems existing in this theater. Brigadier General Hugh Kinnear, the present Air Service Commander, deserves great credit for building up the Air Service Command to its present state of efficiency. The great influx of heavy bombers and fighters requiring modification, nearly 1,000 aircraft having been received in a single month, has recently placed a tremendous burden and caused considerable congestion in all the Air Service Command depots and facilities. It would not be sound to build these depot facilities of a size to handle the peak loads with dispatch and which would consequently be partially employed in normal times. In the current creation of our depots, therefore, we have built to the best compromise we could envisage. We have provided repair facilities to handle the predicted flow of battle damage when the Air Force is operating at its ultimate strength. It has been suggested that airplanes should be delivered to this theater completely ready for combat to take the great burden of modification off the maintenance establishments in this theater. This, obviously, represents the ideal. Changing enemy tactics and the appearance of new enemy weapons makes this solution not entirely practicable. Some modification will always be necessary in war theater. What we must do is promptly communicate to the zone of the interior the necessity for modifications as soon as they appear. Thereafter, these modifications must be fitted into the production line and into the modification centers at home as soon as possible. Modification kits must be provided from the zone of the interior for airplanes already delivered to the theater. Under the material heading, one of the great problems confronting the U.S. Army Air Forces and the U.K. is the creation of a mobile maintenance setup as part of the 9th Air Force to accompany it when it supports our invasion forces and particularly as it moves forward. We must also maintain the 8th Air Force sufficiently mobile so that its maintenance establishments can go with it to any other theater of operations when the task here is done. These requirements have been clearly visualized and the organization is being created towards these ends. This must not be lost sight of in the future. The operations in this theater have indicated some deficiencies in our pre-war equipment planning. It has been clearly demonstrated that those charged with the provision of flying clothing and other combat crew equipment had not clearly visualized the rigors incident to high altitude flying. We have done everything possible to meet these hard conditions on personal flying above 25,000 feet and in temperatures often 50 degrees below zero by developing here in the 8th Air Force adequate clothing and protective devices. It is equally true that the destructive effect of anti-aircraft fire had not been fully realized. It had not been anticipated in peacetime that such saturations of anti-aircraft fire would be encountered in target areas. We have met this condition locally by providing bulletproof clothing and curtains in an effort to cut down the very high percentage of low-velocity wounds which our personnel have experienced. 
The manufacture of this equipment has been initiated in this theater and the zone of the interior has been promptly notified of the requirements. Our operational experience has shown that our logistics planning has been sound. We have kept the zone of the interior continually notified of future requirements in fuel and in munitions of all categories, and the flow of this material from the United States has, in general, been satisfactory. There has been times when shortages of shipping have curtailed an adequate flow of supplies, but these periods have been brief and have not greatly curtailed operations. Section 5. Plans the planning section of the headquarters, 8th Air Force, as it has been organized and as it has operated, has been entirely for the purpose of target planning. The planning with respect to operations, material and maintenance, personnel and intelligence, has been supervised by subsections under those respective staff heads. The target planning function, under the supervision of an A-5, this headquarters, has performed an important service for this Air Force. It discharges the liaison functions with the Air Ministry, the War Office, the Admiralty, the Ministry of Economic Warfare, and all other British agencies for the collection and study of complete data with respect to all targets listed under the directives. And it is the agency through which there is disseminated to the subordinate commands the briefing data on prospective targets. Shortly after operations were initiated by the 8th Air Force, it became apparent that there must be the closest cooperation with RAF Fighter Command, 8th Air Force Fighter Command, Medium Bombers of 9th Air Force, the RAF Tactical Air Forces, and with the RAF Coastal Command in connection with Air Sea Rescue. Each mission which was launched by our 8th Bomber Command had to be supported by forces of those above organizations. Our bomber commander selected his targets and immediately notified the commanders of the units and organizations named above and worked out with them a coordinated plan. It was apparent that some organization must be established to plan for the large-scale major attacks on the principal German targets well in advance to ensure coordination of all these separate agencies. After consolation with the Air Ministry and the organizations named above, it was decided to establish a combined operations planning committee, composed of representatives of 8th Bomber Command, 8th Fighter Command, and 9th Air Force on the American side, and of RAF Fighter Command and RAF Bomber Command on the British side. This committee was permanently established at the headquarters of 8th Bomber Command and was charged with the function of planning the operations against our major targets. These plans were submitted, after completion, to the commanders concerned and after approval by the 8th Air Force commander, they were given code names and filed at each operating headquarters against future need. When the 8th Bomber commander, at his daily operations conference, selected one of these targets for attack, the code name was immediately passed to all the related commands and the operational plan previously prepared was put into effect. The Combined Operational Planning Committee has served a very useful purpose and, by agreement with the Commander-in-Chief, Allied Expeditionary Air Force, it is to be continued as an Operational Coordinating Planning Committee. A very important function of this unit is to observe the enemy reaction to each of our major missions and the data thus procured is used in planning future assaults on German industry. This unit studies also the reports of the Operational Research Section of 8th Bomber Command and 8th Fighter Command, and employs and profits by the data collected by these organizations. Operational research was originated in the 8th Bomber Command of this Air Force. It is composed of a group of scientists who study every phase of our operations and of enemy reaction, catalog results, and draw conclusions. It has now been definitely demonstrated that the studies of this organization are invaluable to Air Force commanders, and that operational research has a staff function and a staff agency in modern aerial warfare, and fills a requirement not supplied by any other staff section. Section 6. Conclusions My experience in organizing the 8th Air Force and in observing its operations for nearly two years convinced me that our tables of organization, conceived in peacetime, are not sufficiently elastic to meet wartime conditions. The best solution to this problem is to allow great latitude to theater and Air Force commanders. They must fit their organization to the local conditions and to the tasks they are directed to perform. The personnel in the organization setup can be best accomplished by allowing theater and Air Force commanders to build up manning tables as contrasted with tables of organization so that the personnel complement can be readily changed to meet changing conditions. It is not possible for an organization in the United States to appreciate fully all of the local conditions in distant theaters, and it takes too long to get approved tables of organizations changed. 
Great savings in manpower could be affected by the employment of locally prepared manning tables, and there will be a noticeable lift in the morale when the organization can quickly be made to fit the task to be performed. We can profit much by the British experience in this regard. In the Air Ministry, there is an establishments committee which goes to a new theater and there works out with the local commander the approved establishment for that theater of war. The local commander is authorized to alter the establishment as conditions change. These establishments provide the grades, ratings, and whole troop basis and serve, as do the tables of organization, as the basis for promotions both of officers and men. The system is absolutely sound and should be adopted in total. 2. Any dispassionate analysis by experienced officers must disclose that the 8th Air Force has had a vital effect on the war in its operations out of the United Kingdom. The enemy reaction definitely discloses that daylight bombing by American forces during the past year has caused the enemy the greatest concern and has resulted in a complete redistribution of his defenses. These operations have also permitted the Russian Air Force to gain air superiority on the Eastern Front. The enemy has indicated quite clearly that he regards daylight precision bombing of his industry as his number one air enemy and the greatest threat to his security. The effect upon the enemy has been out of all proportion to the size of the American forces involved and engaged. 3. The combined bomber offensive plan has been shown by succeeding events to be completely sound. Its yardsticks as visualized when it was presented and approved have been demonstrated by the past year's operations to be the proper measurements for the volume of Air Force operations and for the losses to be expected. The replacement flow of aircraft and crews required, as predicted in this report, have proven to be very accurate. 4. The organization of the 8th Air Force, as originally conceived and as approved by the theater commander in the War Department, has been demonstrated to be efficient and probably the most economical which could be devised, particularly in view of the communications and aerodrome establishments which existed and which could not be changed because of the shortage of material and labor. 5. The theater commander and his staff have supported and encouraged the operations of the 8th Air Force in every conceivable way. The accomplishments of this Air Force would have been impossible without that support. The services of supply have also completely supported our operations. General Devers, the theater commander, and General Lee, the SOS commander, by their personal example of leadership deserve a great measure of the credit for the success of the operations of the 8th Air Force. Without their help and encouragement and their leadership, it would have been impossible for this Air Force to accomplish this task. The undersigned, as commander of the 8th Air Force during the past 13 months, is deeply indebted to these officers and their able staffs. This headquarters and all our subordinate commanders freely acknowledge this indebtedness and express gratitude for the complete support received. 6. The undersigned was designated as Commanding General, U.S. Army Air Forces and U.K. upon establishment of the 9th Air Force out of the old 8th Air Force Support Command, in order to ensure complete coordination between the 8th and 9th Air Forces. On December 15th, under a directive from the Combined Chiefs of Staff, the 9th Air Force passed to the operational control of the Commander-in-Chief, Allied Expeditionary Air Force. Experience since that date has indicated clearly that there is still an urgent requirement for a commanding general, U.S. Air Forces and U.K., to coordinate the relations between the 8th and 9th Air Forces and to ensure the completion of the buildup of the 9th Air Force as planned. When turned over to the Commander-in-Chief, Allied Expeditionary Air Forces, the 9th Air Force was far from complete. As a matter of fact, its ultimate establishments were less than 25% complete. Neither the Commanding General, 9th Air Force, nor the Commander-in-Chief, Allied Expeditionary Air Forces, possess the means to complete the build-up of the 9th Air Force. It will require the closest coordination in the 8th Air Force if the build-up of the 9th Air Force is to be completed on time. The two U.S. Army Air Forces in the United Kingdom cannot be allowed to become competitive. This can only be prevented by the continuation of the designation of a responsible commanding officer as Commanding General, U.S. Army Air Forces in U.K. Such an office is also made necessary in order that there may be but one agency for coordination with the British in the highest levels. 7. The accomplishments of the 8th Air Force in the United Kingdom indicates clearly that our American personnel is of a very high order. 
Both our officers and men show that they have been well trained in the zone of the interior and they deserve great credit, not only for the accomplishments of their assigned task, but because of the relations they have by their conduct established with our allies in whose committees they live and with whose armed forces they cooperate. This Air Force has been particularly fortunate in having able officers as fighter and bomber commanders and in having been provided efficient, diligent, and hardworking staff officers in all staff echelons. The courage and fortitude of the combat crews have been magnificent. Their high spirits, their enthusiasm for their tasks, and their devotion to duty have left nothing to be desired. The maintenance echelons also deserve the highest praise and commendation. Many conditions pertain in this theater, including blackout, dispersion of living and technical sites, shortages of transportation, inadequate recreational facilities, which might well have discouraged less earnest and able soldiers and resulted in a depreciation of effort. It is not unusual at our station in this Air Force to find technicians working 24 hours without sleep or rest in order to put a mission in the air at the appointed time. Section 7. Recommendations 1. It is recommended that the general plan for the destruction of the principal targets in the key systems of German industry be continued and followed to successful conclusion. The plan first labeled the combined bomber offensive has proven eminently sound. It must be continually studied and altered to meet changing conditions, but its overall framework and general concept have been proven to be correct. It sets forth the best means by which heavy bombardment may be employed in daylight in coordination with RAF night bombing program for the reduction of German industry to a point where it cannot continue to supply the requirements of the German war machine. 2. It is recommended and urged that the heavy strategic bombers of the 8th Air Force be kept on the task of destroying German industry and not diverted to the battlefield. The Allied Tactical Air Forces provide a weapon for the close support of our land and sea forces in invasion. My experience of commanding the 8th Air Force to date, and my close observation of enemy reaction, convinces me that the greatest contribution our heavy bombers can make to the war effort lies in continuing them on their present task, the destruction of German industry. 3. The combined bomber offensive stated clearly that the immediate objective of the highest priority was the destruction of the German fighter force. Nothing which has occurred since has altered my conviction that the German Air Force must be destroyed before the German war machine can be expected to collapse, and before Germany will be uncovered to such an extent that heavy bombardment can deal a decisive blow to German industry. The three methods which the 8th Air Force has employed in this effort to destroy German Air Force includes attack on aircraft factories, the destruction of enemy fighters in the air, and the destruction of his air forces on the ground by attacks on his aerodromes. It is believed that these three forms of attack still represent the soundest, surest way to accomplish the depletion and ultimate elimination of German air strength. 4. It is recommended that the Commanding General, U.S. Strategic Air Forces in Europe, also be designated, in addition to his other duties, as the Commanding General, U.S. Army Air Force in U.K. This in order that he may coordinate administratively the relations between the 8th and 9th Air Forces and ensure the harmonious buildup of both to their eventual planned strength. 